Can I uh, get a bit of uh, interaction with you guys straight away? Um, on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, 10 being design thinking, yeah, yeah, baby, we do this every single day. This is how we do business through to 1, what is design thinking? Uh, how many people in here would be a 1 to 3? A good number. Cool, cool, cool. How many people at the other end of the spectrum, how many people have, uh, uh, are using design thinking in their current practice on a regular basis? A couple guys. Right. Can you guys just stand up? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, stand up. You put your hand up, you're going to stand up. Yeah. And, and have a look at these guys, uh, folks, because um, today's not about me, it's about design thinking. So um, have, have a chat with these guys, and you guys, you feel free to jump in, right, and, and uh, give us your perspective. Um, because it's a, it's a great subject, but it's very broad, and, and there is a lot to learn. So we're just going to scratch the, the surface today. Um, first of all, uh, just uh, two minutes on uh, human synergistics. Um, and, and no, it's not a sell job. I just want to sh explain how we came to design thinking. Um, we're actually a human performance consultancy, so we, we measure things like the way people think, the way people behave. Um, we measure team, uh, team dynamics. We measure organisational culture. Um, and so how people believe they're expected to behave in their organisations, etc. And, and we do that really well. But measuring and identifying stuff and, and then doing something about it are, are, are two, different, uh, two different things altogether. And so we, we struggled with, once we've identified something, how do we help a client actually address it? Because what they were doing was they were going away and benchmarking, and nothing against benchmarking, but it's a very quick way to become average across an industry or a country pretty quickly, right? So how do we get people to be creative? So we went looking, and about three years ago we found uh, this design thinking um, methodology, and, and we, we liked it a lot. And so we, this is how we came uh, across it ourselves, uh, with the intention of specifically helping organisations address human uh, opportunities inside their business. Um, what we found, though, is that uh, as we've uh, worked with clients, uh, design thinking is endless. You, you can apply design thinking to almost anything, okay, uh, as a way. Now, it's not the only way of resolving an issue, uh, creating an opportunity. It's a tool that you should have in your toolbox uh, and that you should use on a re very regular basis. But it's not the be-all and end-all. It's not everything, right? So, um, first and foremost, it's just a tool. So, uh, what I want to do, um, can you read that from the back? Can you read that? Can you read that? Okay, just, just, just have a read of this because actually this isn't as funny as it, th as it looks. And, and, and as always, Dilbert really cuts through to the point, doesn't it? Um, this is actually the reality in many, many organisations. There, there's a paradox. Um, we, we, uh, we want you to get out there and do great business, but we don't want you to take any risks. Um, and uh, so design thinking is something which most managers, once they understand it, actually start feeling quite uh, comfortable with. So what I'd like to, um, what I'd like to do to, uh, today is just very quickly, who is design thinking? Because it, it's, it's good to know this. But what is design thinking? Why design thinking? Um, some key focus areas, j just to emphasise if you're just going to go and start doing something, what are the couple of things that you should perhaps look at uh, focusing on rather than the whole thing? And I want to bring, you know, it's marketing month, so, so let's bring the marketing concept in for a, uh, for a quick conversation. And I'm going to try and get through this reasonably quickly, but feel free to interrupt, um, but so that at the end we can uh, have a decent Q&A and, and take the conversation where you'd like to take it. So I hope that f sounds like a fair plan. Uh, let's get into it. Um, who is design thinking? Um, uh, IDEO. Uh, has anyone heard of IDEO? Who, who's heard of IDEO? Okay, so, so, so less than half. IDEO is a, a design agency, and these are the guys who fundamentally came up with the concept of design thinking. Okay, they borrowed from um, product design methodologies, and, and they brought this, um, this approach into designing all sorts of things. Um, in New Zealand, uh, the new seats in the uh, in New Zealand uh, planes, uh, IDEO was the design consultancy who assisted in New Zealand uh, uh, with that approach. Um, this is where Steve Jobs went uh, many moons ago. 
hey, can you guys design us a mouse? Um, and so IDEO are these guys. They also design the inside of the new Hyundai vehicles. Um, and so they're, uh, they, these are the leaders in the field, if you like. And um, this is important because the methodology we use is exactly the IDEO methodology. There are lots of other methodologies around, and they're all good. They're all good, right? So um, we're not uh, saying use this only, this is the best one. This is just the one that we use, and I'll take you through that. Um, there's uh, some organisations, other organisations out there, worth noting down potentially uh, Dublin, um, which belongs to one of the, uh, the big four accounting practices. Uh, they have a slightly different methodology. It's worth having a look at. Um, and uh, IBM um, is another one worth having a look at. They, they too have a, a great setup and a good website where you can get some, uh, some good information. Experience Point. Um, Experience Point are uh, technical partners with IDEO. Experience Point um, have built a simulation um, based on the IDEO design thinking model, and, and that's the methodology that we use. So Experience Point uh, is a business partner of ours, um, and they're business partners with IDEO, so we, we sort of um, say we're, you know, we have a relationship with IDEO, but it's through Experience Point. And, and the slides I'm going to show you today are, are, are from Experience Point, so uh, I would like to reference them for that. Uh, that's pretty cool. So, so that's, um, that's the what. Let's get into the content. Um, has anyone heard of the D School? D School? D School is the design school. Uh, it's at Stanford University, and, and it's a really awesome place. And interestingly enough, the D School came from IDEO. So usually a university spins off a, a private practice, but in this case, uh, it spun back the, uh, the other way. Um, and Tim Brown was one of the guys responsible for this. Um, there's a couple of key things uh, in this definition of design thinking. And the one that I really want to push with you is it starts with people. So design thinking is all about the user. So if we're designing a chair or we're designing a uh, HR practice, um, we start with the user. And you might think, well, yeah, that's pretty normal, right? Um, and in fact, it's not. Most organisations design things from their own point of view, their own perspective. They design something which uses their assets, they design something which uses their expertise. And then they create something and they hope that it meets a customer need. Design thinking starts with the user. Okay, so it's a very important point. Um, so what I want to do now is take you through the six, uh, six key steps of the IDEO uh, design thinking model and um, uh, just weave a few stories uh, through these six steps. The key thing I'd like to point out here um, on the uh, excess here, uh, concrete, um, defining the challenge, observations and forming insights are very much concrete, okay, basing around fact. Um, the insights you'll see starts to move into the abstract and then the framing opportunities and the brainstorming ideas is definitely in that abstract space. Okay, so we're actually starting with hard data. What can we see? What are we trying to, uh, sorry, sorry, what are we trying to uh, address? What do we see? And then we're starting to move into that abstract space before coming back into um, the abstract uh, concrete again with trying experiments. You'll see across the top the three eyes. In this stage here, we're trying to get inspiration and framing opportunities and brainstorming ideas, that is the ideation, and then we get to the implementation. So let me take you through each of these six steps with a little bit more detail. And as I say, please, uh, please sing out. Um, uh, key thing with uh, design thinking is uh, where we start, and I said it starts with the, uh, starts with the person. Um, when we're looking at business ideas, uh, desirability, feasibility and viability are the, are the three things that we need to look at. But a lot of organisations actually don't start with desirability at all. They start with viability. Can we make money out of it? Then is it feasible? Can we build it? And then cool, let's do it. What about desirability? Yeah, we'll make it desirable. That's marketing's job, right? So, um, so it's marketing month, so I'm going to pick to that. But actually, desirability is the place to start, and that's why the user is key. Because if you can identify what a user needs, they might not know it themselves, but if you can identify what a user needs, then you're creating opportunities for your organisation. All right? So desirability is key. 
Feasibility, sure, it's got to be technically possible. And viability, you've got to make money out of it. But desirability is king. Okay, so first point, desirability, start there. And the way, of course, to find desirability is to focus on that user. The first step then is to um, design, uh, define the challenge. And um, Eero Saarinen came up with this uh, really cool quote. Just have a read of this. And so it's about context. It's not about something in isolation, right? And defining the challenge is actually one of the hardest things to do well, okay? In defining the challenge, there are two key things, and I'll say it again, and I'm going to keep saying it. You start with the user. Who is the user? I was doing a job um, not so long ago with an organisation who wanted to sell more of something. Um, I won't say who it was, obviously, but they wanted to sell more of something, and we said to them, well, who's the user in that objective? And of course they are. They want to sell more of something. So why don't we turn that around and identify who's the user? So how might we help the consumer to gain access to your products uh, more readily? And all of a sudden, boom, we've got completely different alternatives coming out. And, and so it's about the user. Who's the key user? And um, often we're too internally focused. So design thinking is really good at getting you to identify the user. And, and you won't be surprised sometimes to find that there might not be one. It's just a great idea, which is an orphan. Okay? So who's the user is key. The other thing in defining the challenge is around the breadth of your objective. At this stage, we're not looking at something like a smart goal, okay? At this stage, what we want to be is we want to be narrow enough to actually address something, but broad enough to give us lots of alternatives. And, and it can be a bit of a balancing act. And it can take quite a long time and lots of conversation. Well, that's not a bad thing, right? But it needs to be broad enough, but narrow enough. So world peace is a little bit too broad, Okay, a little bit too broad, but hard. What are you actually trying to focus on? So you need to bring it down, but you don't want to bring it down. And one of the clues around uh, if it's too narrow is where you've got a solution half baked into your objective. So you don't want any solutions anywhere near your uh, challenge. Okay, you want to keep it quite broad. Um, the, um, there's a great example, and I think Ray Avery has done a, um, one of these presentations. Um, uh, Ray Avery worked with the D School and, and sponsored a group of guys from the D School to go to India. There, there's um, uh, issues in India um, with uh, the death of very, very you know, newborn babies. Uh, the death rate's quite high. And so they went over to try and design a new incubator. But the key thing is that they went over, uh, and um, this, this brings us to um, observations, right? Because initially their defined challenge was around the incubator, but when they went and observed what was going on, they found incubators empty in hospitals. Uh, and then they realised actually incubation wasn't the issue, it was access. These people lived miles away from hospitals. And so the whole challenge was redefined, to, uh, to, to meet the, uh, the goal. And as most people know, they came up with that, um, that little uh, sleeping bag uh, type arrangement, which was like a portable incubator. Very cheap, very portable, um, very easy to charge, etc. Um, if you don't know that story, it's well worth looking up. It's a great example of design thinking. But it was this next stage, this second stage of observation. You've got to get out of your office. You've got to get out. You know, it doesn't matter how often we teach people design thinking, they'll then sit there and go, we know our clients really well, let's have a conversation about what we're going to do next. You, you're missing the whole point, right? You've got to get out. You've got to see what's going on. Observation is critical. And um, uh, this, uh, this quote from Steve Jobs is actually a little bit longer than this. Um, he, he says before this, uh, I don't like focus groups. Right? I don't like focus groups. A lot of times people don't know what they want until you show it to them. And later on, I've got the Henry Ford quote. You know, if I gave people what they wanted, it would have been a faster horse type thing. Um, and and uh, so, so a couple of quick stories, a uh, couple of quick stories around uh, the power of um, observation. Um, an electronics company, um, uh, remember the old boom boxes? 
to, for, there's some people who are looking at me funny. It's okay. Uh, the older guys, you know, the boom people used to walk down listening to their music and the boom boxes. And, and this organisation wanted to cut through, so they said, "Hey, let's let's come up with a different colour." All right, let's come up with a different colour. Yellow. I don't know how they got there, but yellow. Yellow is a great colour. And they had all these focus groups, and everyone was like, "Yeah, yellow's the yellow's the new black type of thing." And, and so at the end of this, and this took quite some time. Um, this process, it, all these focus groups, and they said, great, we're going to do yellow. They made some yellow ones, had a final focus group, and they said to the folks, thanks very much for your participation. Help yourself to a boom box on the way out. And they had a pallet of yellow ones and a pallet of black ones. And they were having a conversation, uh, patting each other on the back, and one of the participants came back and says, oh, look, excuse me, um, the, you wouldn't have any more black ones, would you? All the, all the black ones are gone. And there was a pallet of yellow ones still sitting there. So here they were about to launch a yellow boombox. And this focus group had said, yeah, 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 yellow, but they took the black ones. All right, so, so through observation, we can quickly see what, what people say and what people do are actually very, very different. Okay, and, and we're going to have a little um, exercise later on, if we've got time, um, to show you how that works. So you've got to get out of the office. This is quite possibly the hardest step in the design thinking um, process, and it's around the discipline of actually getting out there. You've got to get out there. It takes time, and time is money, So, you, you, but there's no shortcuts, right? You've got to get out. Um, when we do get out, um, one of the things that uh, design thinking uh, wants to emphasise is Typically, you would go and have a look at your mass market because that's where the, oppor- the major opportunity for selling is. But actually, no, that, that's where we'll validate. But actually, the ideas come from extreme users. So people who have taken what you've done and, and done something radical with it and people who perhaps don't even use your product or seldom use it. And we want to try and find out why, what's going on with that, but also why have they done what they've done. So extreme users are the people that you should highlight. So not only are we just going to go and observe customers, we're going to go and observe specific customers. Okay? Um, you've got to get out from behind your desk because this was a pharmaceutical company, uh, a packaging company, sorry, for a pharmaceutical, um, for the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, they decided to go out and have a look at some extreme users. And, of course, uh, packaging, they're trying to make a child safe, but at the same time accessible. And as you can see, this woman's hands are are quite affected by arthritis. And so they're sitting down and they're talking to this lady and they said, "Um, do you have any, knowing what the answer is going to be, do you have any problems getting into the uh, child tamper-proof? No, no problems at all. And they looked at her and they said, what? And then they... Show us how you get into it. So she took them into the kitchen and got the old meat slicer out and zipped off the top of uh, the bottle. And you don't get that by doing focus groups, right? You've got to get out there and you've got to see. And asking questions like, do you have any problems? No. That's not going to get you anything. Show me, and we're going to practice this later on, show me you're now starting to get some really uh, good information. So you've got to get out. Um, the fly on the wall approach, uh, this is just a, a classic photo from quite some uh, time ago. Um, but this is a, a phone booth that a guy has used as suitcase as a seat and as a laptop stand. Why? Because this airport didn't have anywhere for people who wanted to get on and just do some work. Now, of course, in airports, not all of them, um, but many of them, you'll see this type of thing. But this is a classic design thinking approach of observation and then an insight, which we're going to move to in the next step. Another way of observing is empathic experiences. Um, Two photographs here. Uh, What do patients see the most of in the first six hours of being admitted to hospital? Roof tiles. Right. And, and when you understand this, your empathy with that patient changes considerably. So now we start thinking about, well, if that's what a patient sees, what can we do? And um, dentists have known this for a little while. And so when you go in and you sit in the dentist's chair, there's usually a poster or a fine wally or something like that, you know, and it keeps the mind uh, entertained. Um, but, uh, so empathic observation. So uh, this is a great approach. Um, and the other one is analogous situations. What, what this means is 
Don't just stay in your own backyard. Get into other people's backyards. And in this particular case here, um, you can see the, uh, the, the um, this is an accident emergency uh, waiting room and um, uh, operations area. And in this particular case, the hospital had a centralised store system. And if you wanted something, you had to go and ask the person who controlled that uh, particular store. So the design group went out and um, uh, observed a number of situations, right? You don't always get it right, uh, but they observed a number of situations. But when they observed this one, the thing which uh, cut through to them was that each of those people changing the four tyres all had their own complete toolkits. So rather than having a centralised toolkit on a trolley here, these guys all had their own toolkits. And this led them to completely redesign so that each team had their own complete uh, toolkit. This was also used, uh, this observation, the insight and then the design, is also used in a lot of manufacturing factories now where uh, people used to walk around with their toolboxes, whereas now there's just complete toolkits available at different parts uh, of, of the factory, and they're not your tools anymore. Okay, so th these are the types of um, ideas you can get by getting out and observing. And, and this is a classic story. Um, it, it's about children. Um, uh, Doug Leitz, I think his name was, um, from uh, GE Healthcare. He went along and um, he was particularly interested in children, and he went along and, to observe what was going on in hospitals. And, and when he was told that 80% of children required some form of sedative to go through an MRI scanner, um, including some going under general anaesthetic, he, he was completely shocked. He didn't realise what an issue it was. Um, if you've ever had an MRI scan, you, you know these things are quite loud and quite noisy, and some of them are almost like little tunnels. And, and so they thought, OK, um, let's get the design team on it. Where do kids have fun in dark places, um, tunnels, which are also noisy? And they thought of theme parks. A and so what they did was they redesigned, and there's eight different designs, but they redesigned the experience, and, and they um, actually constructed stories. And so when kids came in, they would start with a story and, and lead them through the story and lead them through um, to do the MRI scan. Less than 6% of children from 80 to now less than 6% of children require a sedative. And in fact, um, he was overjoyed when he was talking to one parent and the child came running up and said, mummy, mummy, can we come back tomorrow? Right? So, so, so this is what you've got to do. You've got to get out. And I've, I've spent a bit of time on observation because it's critical. Yep, you've got to get the challenge defined correctly. Um, but observations, uh, this, is where, uh, this is where you're going to get the gold. And... Let's be clear, observations is about collecting dots, all right? Collecting the dots. Forming insights is about joining the dots. And so we want to get out there and get all sorts of observations without judgment. And I promise you, it's really difficult to do because you see something and you go, I know why they're doing that. You, you've got to drop that agenda. You've got to drop your unconscious bias and you've just got to observe, take notes and then put it all together, and that's where you can actually uh, join multiple dots that you wouldn't otherwise uh, join to form insights. Okay, and this is a, a great quote from Marcel Proust. Has anyone in here seen the, um, uh, the uh, gorilla video with the basketball players? I need a couple of guys. Okay, yeah, I thought about putting it in, you know. Um, Google it. Seriously, uh, Google it. And, um, but, but I'll just I'll walk you through it. It's hard to believe. But you set people up. You say, I want you to count how many times... There's two teams, a team in white and a team in black, three or four people on each team. I want you to count how many times the, the black team pass the ball to each other. And it's really hard, so keep your eyes open and, and count. Um, so while that's going on, uh, a gorilla walks across the stage, stops, beats its chest, and then walks off. And at the end of it, you say to people, right, what sort of animal did you see? And 90% of people go, what animal? Right? And, and this is how the human brain works. If you are out there to observe something, that's all you'll see. All right? It's a great little video. Um, so take a look at it. But now you know there's a gorilla in it, you'll see it. But... Seriously, show it to some of your colleagues at work and set them up. Now, this is really hard. Count the basketball passes, and they won't see it. 
Okay, well, many of them won't see it. And, and so this way observations are really, really difficult because if we don't get good observations, forming really cool insights, insights that really cut through, it, it is impossible. All right, because you go out there to collect the data that you're always going out there to collect. You need to open the mind, and that will open the opportunity for the insights. Okay, um, a quick little one here is uh, just Huggies. Um, it's interesting, the guys who made Huggies thought they, made, um, uh, they thought they were making disposable nappies. Yeah, and you're thinking that's what they are, right? But apparently when they went out and observed the way that they're used and talked to parents uh, around how they use them, they're a clothing item. A- and that completely revolutionised the way that they thought and designed uh, the Huggies. So they started coming out with patterns and designs. And they're not just a, a, a nappy um, all right, they're a clothing item and until they went out it seems obvious always in the past but when they went out and talked to parents they had no idea and observed the way they were using the nappies they had no idea that that's what they were so that changed their whole design philosophy so validation is um, those extreme users just to check in uh, that's where we're going to get our, uh, our insights what are they doing, why are they doing it that's really interesting We can then go and check those insights, um, validate them with the mass market, okay? So the mass market does play a role. Um, Moving now from the concrete to the abstract, we want to frame opportunities. And um, uh, you might have heard me say uh, earlier, uh, how might we? Um, How might we is a way that design thinkers frame their challenges. And in defining the challenge, how might we is quite broad. But once we've um, gone and done our observations and we've got insights, we now start to basically reframe our challenge and we start getting a little more specific. And again, we use how might we. Okay, so how might we? And and then how might we, who's the user? So how might we help a certain user group to achieve a certain thing? This is the key. So this is the part where we start narrowing in. And design thinking is in fact a diverging converging process. So we do this all the time. Okay? So framing the opportunities and once we have an opportunity that we quite like, um, and you can have a number of them, uh, we're now going to brainstorm. Now, how many people in here um, have done brainstorming before? And, and, and how many people in here have create, think that brainstorming creates some value? And there's a difference in the number of hands, right? Um, Brainstorming uh, done properly uh, is a really useful approach. But often it's not done properly. Okay, now I'm not going to give you a lesson on brainstorming, but uh, if you you want, I'll include a slide actually uh, around the rules for brainstorming. But brainstorming, when you've got a specific opportunity and done with the rules, uh, I'll send you the rules in, in this pack, is actually really, really effective. And, and so for those of you, and, and this, the reason I ask the question is there's been some people come out recently saying brainstorming's overrated, brainstorming's dead, brainstorming doesn't work. Um, it does work. It's not the only thing that works. So again, I'm not trying to say do this uh, or else, it's the only way of doing it. But brainstorming done well is really, really effective. And um, uh, in the program that we run, we have a video from IDEO and they um, they run a brainstorming session as an example and it's pretty awesome when you see a team that's well practiced at doing it so um, uh, this is the next step and then this is the last one and this is, this is the uh, if defining the challenge is important observations is really important insights really hard this is the other one that people don't do once they've got a good idea they're off to market all right. What we want to do here in trying experiments is to test our ideas. And in fact, um, you can see what David Kelly uh, has said here. And, and David went off to form the D School at Stanford. Fail early to succeed sooner. In fact, there's another one which I quite like, which is fail fast and fail often to succeed sooner. And this is all about um, learning um, through prototyping. Okay, and um, a simple example here could be, um, in fact, a real one. Um, uh, you would have seen last, uh, when was it? It was only about five, six months ago. Um, uh, Elon Musk came out and said, hey, who wants to buy um, my new uh, Model X 
cheaper version of the car. Pay me a thousand US dollars if you'd like to. Um, 350,000 people paid him a thousand US dollars. That's actually a type of prototyping. Right? He's already got an issue now because now he has to try and find a way of making them. But um, you can set up a website and say, hey, here's this thing. Would you like to buy it? People go, yeah. They click on the button and you say, well, it's in, um, it's in uh, development at the moment. We'll let you know when it's coming. Um, actually, it's probably not in development just yet. It, it's a test to see how desirable is this product. That's a type of prototyping, right? Um, so you don't actually have to build a product. You could just build the image of a product. Does that make sense to everybody? And there's many, many different ways of doing these um, experiments. Um, a simple one that we talk about on the course is where someone came in and got rid of all of the polystyrene cups and put uh, ceramic cups out um, with a sign saying, hey, earth-friendly ceramic cups, use these. And um, it was just an experiment to see if people would use them. Within 30 minutes, they were all gone and the uh, polystyrene cups were back. And um, what they realised they hadn't done is talk to the facilities manager and, and, and he made it quite clear that he was the one who was going to have to go around and pick up all the cups off the desks and put them in a dishwasher. And that's, so that's a learning. Does that make sense? It's a learning. It's not a failure. It's a learning. So even though we use the word fail uh, in the process, really it, it's about failing to learn. Right? We fail to learn. And, and so instead of investing a million dollars in an idea, invest a hundred and test some of the core questions or hypotheses that you have around this idea. And do lots of tests. Uh, and I think that the classic example of doing lots of tests has to be Thomas Edison, doesn't it? Um, they're not quite sure, but they're pretty close to a thousand light bulbs before we got the working method. Each one was a failure, but of course each one was a lesson learned, and, and that's how he developed um, the product. So Neil, there's a, there's a couple of questions coming through here, because often there's some misunderstanding around experimentation, isn't there? Because a couple of the questions are, yes, we'd love to experiment, but we don't have a website, so we can't test in beta. But I know IDEO's point is you can experiment with less than an hour and $20. So it becomes cardboard and masking tape and polystyrene, not necessarily infrastructure and tools and that level of investment. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Um, you, you, what you're testing is not the product so much as uh, the concept of the product. And so there's a question in there. Hey, will people come? Will people buy? Will people... And so once you understand the question that you'd like to uh, have an answer to, you can design an experiment, cheap and nasty. And um, on our programs, people have just got uh, flip chart paper and, and walked out on the streets, Queen Street, with a flip chart paper with a question and, and stopped people, hey, hey, you know, da, da, and had conversations. So, so you, you don't have to go um, into major production. Um, interestingly enough, um, th there's a... Uh, and now that I want to say it, I'm going to forget the name of it. But there, there is a little app that you can um, get where you can take a whole lot of photographs of things and you can put hotspots on it. And, and within 15 minutes, you can actually build an app and then you can give it to someone else to use and, and then just say what was good about that, what was so good, and you can watch them use it. Um, so you can actually do uh, testing in so many different ways now. And, and that app is um, uh, fundamentally free. Um, and building a website, there, 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 are, there are actually organisations now who test your ideas. All right? now, we, we haven't used any, I must admit, um, yet, um, but there are organisations out there where you can say, hey, we've got this idea, and they say, yeah, you should do this, we'll do it for you, boom. And they don't charge very much. And so for a few hundred dollars, uh, they'll do something. And so they have access to the web, and they have pages that they can build. Um, but don't underestimate just that uh, uh, duct tape and uh, cardboard box approach to, to testing the idea. It's the idea you're testing, not the product itself. I hope that makes sense. And one of the things that's also talked quite a lot about within experimentation is the use of storyboarding, like you would for a commercial, but storyboarding a, an experience of using a service, whether it's going in to buy a sandwich at a cafe or buying a dress online, to storyboard that like you would a commercial to go out and test that. Does each of those steps make sense too? Yeah, storyboarding is a fantastic idea. Um, Pixar, when they do all of their movies, uh, all their kids' movies, um, basically uh, every scene in a Pixar movie is storyboarded. So um, fundamentally, uh, you might have 120 storyboards for 120 scenes for 120 minutes of, of a Pixar movie, and they'll storyboard it, and they'll storyboard it, and they'll just keep regenerating the storyboards well, well before they even think about production. Um, so w was Donald Trump experimenting in his interviews? But Perhaps was one of the questions. We leave that one. The um, yeah, that's interesting. Right? 
sort of, you're streaming this live, so yeah, I was thinking about what I could say. Um, but the thing about experimentation is experiment with desirability first. Answer those questions first. You know, the viability, feasibility are all well and good, but if you haven't tested desirability, if it's not desirable, you're wasting your time. So do the testing around desirability first. Right? Once you've, yeah, we've, got, we've got desire, there is a desire for this product, this service, then start doing the uh, prototyping um, around uh, feasibility and, and viability. Um, how are we going for time? About 10 to go. Cool. Um, so, so why design thinking? Um, look, I decided to throw this in. Uh, I just, I think it's important. Um, this equation stands for uh, performance is equal to motivation times capability times opportunity. And, and um, this uh, performance equation is relevant to um, individuals, it's relevant to teams, it's relevant to organisations, it's also relevant to countries if we're talking about economic performance. So performance is equal to motivation times capability times opportunity. Um, there, is a, there is a second slide which has got some detail uh, to that. Design thinking is about opportunity, in my uh, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Motivation and um, capability, sure, you've got to have the skills, but it's around creating the opportunity in your business, and this is a piece that I want to uh, focus on. Um, design thinking is um, not something that we want to have a specialist team uh, do in your business. It, it, it's, um, uh, you know, if you're talking about being uh, innovative, uh, you, you want your whole business to be on board. And, and so design thinking is not a specialist uh, skill. It should be a generic skill across your total team. All right? you, you want your staff out there um, taking photographs of interesting things. Hey, look at that. Boom. Um, there are platforms that you can use. Um, OI Engine, Open Innovation Engine. Um, Battery, which is spelt uh, at the end, double I. Uh, Mural. Um, these are technology platforms, digital platforms, which allow masses of people to contribute. So if you come up with a design challenge, don't keep it to yourself. Um, try and find a way of getting it out there and asking people, hey, what observations have you made um, that might be useful for us? And so people can you know, use, use the power of social media through some of these platforms, get them taking photos, sending stuff in. You still have your core team who are going to manage the process and who are going to decide what cool content they're going to use. Um, so through each step you can, um, uh, for example, around observations, you can collect all the data and then you can go back to people and say, awesome, we've collected all this data, H here it is, um, what insights does this give you? And so you can open it back up again to, and so you can actually take people right through the process. Um, and there's a good example of an airline overseas um, who use uh, all of their staff, as many as possible, but especially the flight attendants, to give them feedback on their menu. And this airline, uh, this airline the net promoter score uh, increased by 16.5 points simply by involving staff in the menu um, uh, design and they were sending back photographs of uneaten food, of eaten food and all sorts of stuff and, and it changed the whole menu and the approach to service um, based on the feedback that they got and that's all they did, 16 and a half net promoter score points uh, advanced and that's quite substantial 4,000 unique contributors to the menu 4,000 unique contributors. Now, one of the other little equations that I like to use um, is ES equals um, D, uh, sorry, Q times A. And ES is effective solutions. And effective solutions are equal to the quality of the solution times the acceptance of the solution. You can actually come up with a really good quality solution in design thinking, but because you've done it in isolation, uh, its implementation is actually quite a struggle. By involving as many people as you can in the process, you're actually going to build your quality up because you're going to get lots of different ideas, but you're also going to enhance your acceptance of the end uh, solution considerably. Right? So effective solutions are equal to quality times acceptance. So design thinking is not just a technical process, it's a human process. And so get as many people involved as possible. Um, quite a few organisations that we work with initially that, that have these super teams. 
okay, and locked away in a room doing this design thinking to come up with this awesome solution. But it's a lost opportunity. All right, manage the process there, but get everyone involved. Hey, I think that's um, probably enough around the concept. So, well, there, there are a couple of questions to exactly that point coming through, which is, um, and paraphrasing some of the questions, where large organisations have sent groups of people off to do design thinking training. They've come back, they're an excited group, it dissipates shortly later, they've ticked that box, but it doesn't live. So how do you get a large organisation to really embrace what design thinking is? A um, couple of answers there. I mean, the first one is it starts from the top. A- a- and so if, the, uh, if your CEO and the exec team, um, they need to go through the design thinking process and learn the power of what it holds. Um, and they need to then reimagine what business could look like with design thinking as uh, a core skill, a core capability across the business. If they're not on board, um, or if they're just buying into, yeah, yeah, no, that's the new fad design thinking, let's support that, then then it's not going to take off. Once they're behind it, um, it's around creating expectations. Uh, You've got a process here. So if someone says, hey, we're we're generating some really cool ideas, um, it's up to those same leaders and and other leaders in the business to say, hey, take me through your journey. You know, how did you define the challenge? How did you um, then design the observation piece? Uh, What insights did you get? And take take me through the learning journey rather than just give me a presentation around the solution. So when when people ask around process, people will use a process. Uh, And, of course, um, it's about... um, um, if people have exposure to design thinking uh, training, if they, if they know how to use it and there's a core group within their own team that are using it and the leader creates that expectation of use, then it's more likely to happen. Um, so rather than picking two people from each function and sending them away, send a whole function and, and see what happens to a group of people who work together every day uh, and put them through the training as a unit. But, it, but it's in there that the interesting tension is, isn't it? Because I'm sure there's people in the rooms thinking, yep, and when I go back to my CEO and say, I think we should fail fast and fail often, that's not going to necessarily be greeted with, that's a splendid idea, let's start. So how, in your experience, how do you move an executive team from there's this thing called design thinking to I think the exec should go and experience it? Yeah, I think one of the most effective ways is you've got to step up and try and understand what uh, what are the current issues facing an organisation at a strategic level. So, so how how is uh, how is performance? So, um, uh, just using ourselves as an example, um, the first step of our client engagement is around understanding the purpose of an organisation. The second step then is to understand how is it performing against that purpose. And so what are the challenges, uh, what are the roadblocks um, that they're facing, and then talking to them about their approach for currently uh, addressing those particular issues, and then showing them how design thinking might be an option for addressing some of those extremely tricky, um, complex Uh, challenges that are facing business. Um, That's what design thinking's major advantage is. um, Because it's a less rational process, what I mean by that is um, rational problem solving is what are the facts, what's our objective, what are the alternatives, uh, let's pick the best one and execute. Design thinking is trying to find um, problems that you might not know about yet. And so, sure, you've got a, a you've got a challenge, but the actual issue that's uh, making that a challenge might be unknown. And so, design thinking is about finding root cause um, or finding that root opportunity, and then addressing it. It's not it's not assuming that you know. A lot of chief executives, a lot of um, look, the chief executives for a reason, right? Um, they they are looking for different ways of thinking to address these age-old problems, and they're looking for competitive advantage, and design thinking uh, is a good way of getting that. For those that are using design thinking that are in the room, is anything that you would add or you would debate in your experience getting a senior team to buy in with an organisation? It's been hard, straightforward? Please. ...to an organisation that's used it, applied it. Talk yeah, to nice. somebody, talk to another business who's got benefit from it and can demonstrate <coughs> how they've applied it to their business. Yeah, so those, those are the, uh, dialing in for the live simulcast, the, the response to that question was take the executive team to an organisation that's currently using it and get them to experience it firsthand. Fantastic. Please. Well, I think when we say fail, we always think about the entrepreneur that goes broke sort of thing, but fail just might mean it didn't work, you know? It's like, it's just do it, analyse it, move on to the next 
you know, a marketing thing or whatever whatever scale that is, but failure doesn't mean you have to go throw it in. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. But we, but we want to scale that failure. Yeah. And, and so those small failures are around those $100. Um, often it's uh, a senior person in the business, um, just to digress slightly, it's often a senior person in the business who has a pet option. Um, that's where the million dollars goes, and they, when it fails, they can't understand how it failed. Um, so, so, you know, you, you want to take that million dollar investment and chop it up into little chunks and use that um, to, to, to create a learning pathway to then invest uh, the million dollars rather than uh, uh, go whole hog. But uh, yeah, that can be quite a difficult uh, conversation with someone who's got a pet project. Um, but, but again, you know, um, design thinking is a way of doing that. Um, were there any other responses from the guys again? Um, yeah, one of the, the issues with design thinking is that if you use it just as another tool um, and you haven't examined the underlying issue that you're trying to solve, um, then it's just another tool. Um, so one of the attractions of design thinking is this process of every time you've done a prototype or you've done something, you say, is this the problem? What is the problem we're actually trying to solve here? Uh, and what I notice in many design thinking approaches is that they never go back and say, is this really the problem we're trying to, to solve? And I think your example um, of the yellow beatbox, you know, that they thought the problem was colour, um, but they're disciplined to say, actually, there's something else here. And design thinking is very effective in terms of actually going uh, underneath what your current thinking is. But that's a discipline I don't actually see that often in design thinking approaches. Yeah, and that's our, probably our biggest challenge is to get people to think um, that design thinking is a way of doing business as opposed to, um, hey, let's get a design thinking team together to address an issue. Um, and so that's, and in fact, Tim Brown, who's um, currently the CEO uh, at IDEO, he, he, he believes that's the next biggest challenge for design thinking. Um, it's in danger of becoming a bit of a fad as opposed to uh, a way of doing business. I'm also that. Um some CEOs might, they might refer to our MPS schools are fine already. Um, we don't actually talk about defining an opportunity as well. There may not be an immediate problem or an issue, but if you're using design thinking, it might, uh, it might reveal an opportunity that people didn't think was there to discover. So it's, it's as though you're saying also, let's try design thinking to see what could be rather than just what is right now because if I look what is right now I don't have a things are fine yes yeah and just to play that <clears throat> excuse me coming back again for those that are, that are dialing in from simulcast that when we define problems such as MPS score that can be reasonably binary is it good or is it not but by reframing problem statements in interesting ways we can look for opportunities that might not exist on the surface yeah, and, and this is where the observation piece is really, really important. Um, and don't forget that when we define the problem up front, we're, we're, we're quite broad still. Um, so, so we haven't drilled down into solving something yet. We're, we're, we've got a challenge, and it's quite broad, right? And so you've got to keep it broad enough, uh, without going to extremes, broad enough that there are plenty of opportunities in there. And there'll be times where we'll run a, um, a workshop and the initial challenge will actually break down into five distinct opportunities, just, just as a number, but five distinct opportunities later on in the frame opportunities uh, piece. And, and they're quite different, but actually it started with the same challenge. Um, so so stay, stay broad, stay broad before, uh, before narrowing in. It is actually a weakness to, to dive straight in. And we'll often have people come to us and say, hey, um, yeah, we're, we're going to make a video and there's a, there's a solution baked right in there, video. So you know, what's the purpose of the video? Why are you making a video? Uh, to support people. To support people who, who exactly? Uh, to support people who are doing something new. Okay, so why don't we reframe that? How might we help people who are new at, a, 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 at something like design thinking um, gain more confidence or gain more exposure? So you change it, all of a sudden you've got, well, why a video? Why not blah, 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 right? So you want to keep it broad <laughs> enough at the beginning. Don't, don't narrow too quickly. Ladies and gentlemen, we're getting quite close to time. I just want to check if there's any more questions from the floor. Um, just a more a statement, I think. Some really good stuff from the floor, particularly the point of innovation and going back to challenge yourself on what the problem is. I think what we see a lot, um, and what I see every day in marketing, is we are classic for jumping to the outcome. And for me, design thinking is a discipline around always asking, 
okay, that might be an outcome, but what is the problem here we're trying to solve? Because an example would be, I get a lot, uh, we need to engage more with our customers, so we should be running more events. Okay, what is the problem we're trying to solve? The event might be the outcome, but if we park that for the moment, what is the problem, what is the engagement issue, what, is the, what are we actually looking for? That might lead us to an outcome of how we might better engage. And that's, I think, really key for these marketers that we often jump to the media, the output, the solution, without going, hey, can we just go back? Can we spend some time debating, challenging, iterating around what is the real problem we're to do? And to, to um, paraphrase that, there's a great point raised on um, our inclination as people slash marketers to jump to auditioning answers rather than concentrating on the problem. In our experience working with design thinking, it's a great, when we work with different organisations already, you can watch people in the observation phase get really frustrated because they jump straight to insights. We're not good at saying, yes, the person was wearing a jacket with a shirt. We like to try and solve that by putting them into a box. So there's interesting tension points along this journey, isn't it, for a change of mindset? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, we probably don't have time this morning, but just uh, a, 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 as a simple example um, of this, um, uh, one of the exercises that we run in a program is uh, to get people to uh, peer up and then um, person A to ask person B, how do you put a contact uh, into a phone? Um, and people give a verbal response. And then to follow that up with show me. And quite often, the verbal response and the actual behaviour of putting the contact in the phone are totally different. And the exercise is designed to um, create awareness with the person asking the question that actually, um, if I had answered that question, I'd done the same thing. I just need to, I just need to blank my mind out and write down what's happening, not not why it's happening. All right, and it's incredibly difficult discipline to do, um, and uh, it does take practice. So, so it is a skill. Okay. So, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, that does bring us to time. Um, I really hope you've enjoyed this morning. The, the, the challenge with the topic like design thinking, uh, as was evidenced with the initial where do you sit in a continuum, is it's such a vast topic. Um, but it's such a vast topic because it's so well researched, it's so well tested, the case studies are so well substantiated. Uh, so on the, on the, f the form that you came in on, uh, there is a feedback panel. And if there's any particular additional questions you would like on design thinking, we'll take those questions, we'll upload them to our social platforms. One of the principles of, of IDEO, uh, a chap called Tom Kelly, who's the brother of the founder, David Kelly, wrote the most incredible book for getting into early introduction to this thinking, which is called Creative Confidence. And Creative Confidence is all about this notion that we are the greatest way to unlock the potential in an organisation or a country is to unlock the inherent creative potential that sits within each of us. So as a, as a recommendation, incredibly well worth uh, checking out. But with that, I'd like you to please uh, join me with a token of appreciation to Neil for his time this morning.